This week, we're talking consumer sentiment and the USDA's first look at 2025 red meat production. Welcome to the weekly livestock market update on Brownfield. I'm your host, Megan Grebner. With us to talk all things markets is University of Missouri Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. Coming up, we'll take a look, closer look at consumer sentiment and we'll dig deeper into the USDA's first outlook for 2025 red meat production. But first, let's recap what happened this week in the markets. Yeah, on the cattle side this week, uh, live fed cattle were a dollar twenty lower on the week. Those feeder cattle markets were a little bit uh, all over the board. I'm, I'm going to call them from three dollars lower to three dollars higher. Uh, June live cattle futures contract was down eighty five cents this week. And the August feeder cattle contract was down $4.35. We did see an uh, increase in the choice box beef price this week. It was up $2.30. The, on the hog side, cash barrels and gilts uh, were up $0.15 cents, uh, this week. The June lean hog futures contract was down $0.65. Cents. Uh, we also gained $0.50 cents on the pork cutout value this week. I think it's interesting, uh, just kind of the inconsistency that we saw in sale barns this week. Some sales were sharply higher, some were not. Um, I did talk to uh, Missouri Department of Agriculture today, and we were talking a little bit about what's been going on. And the one thing that Tony noted was that he saw a shift to a more traditional breakout of steers and heifers in terms of sales, opposed to... Um, that 50-50 split or or more heifers that we've been seeing. How much are you watching some of that with us not, most likely, not having uh, the July cattle inventory numbers? How, how important is that extra data uh, that we see around the country? I, so I think that certainly could add to the uh, information flow, given we probably won't see a cattle inventory report. Um it should correspond very nicely to what we see in terms of heifers on feed out of the quarterly report, but we can see that a little more real time as we go week by week. So uh, we're going to need to look at those alternative ways to think about uh, herd expansion uh, if, if in fact, the cattle report uh, isn't resurrected by July. I think it'll be interesting to see, and 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 I guess maybe tracking that data week after week and um, seeing if maybe there's a little glimmer of optimism or uh, some some producers start to make that that shift in their mindset. Yeah, and and I think weather's part of this that's p- playing a role as uh, forage supplies, at least in some parts of the of the country, are are returning um, to to better positions than they've been in a few years. Or perhaps that's the impetus to see a little bit more herd growth than otherwise would be the case. This week's drought monitor looks a whole lot better, especially for your state, than it has in uh, the last three months. It seems like we've gotten more general rainfall happening, although it's come with other uh, storm-related damage, but uh, more general rainfall than we've seen for a while. Scott, let's take a look at weekly slaughter numbers. Um, as we take a look back at this week. How how are things stacking up? Yeah, so USDA tells us for the week ending May 11th, a run of 622,000 head of cattle this week. That's unchanged from what we did last week, but down 22,000 from the same week a year ago. On the hog side, a run of 2.39 million head of hogs this week. That's down 17,000 head from what we did last week, but up 28,000 head from what we did last year. As we look at those numbers, comparison year over year. Yep. So cattle is now down 4.4%, which should remind us, you know, you look at what cattle slaughter has been doing of late. We've been running a lot closer uh, to year ago levels. We've continued to see that percentage decline go down. And on the pork side, we're uh, half a percent higher on hog slaughter year to date. Two big reports out this week. Um, Consumer sentiment, supply and demand. We'll start first with consumer sentiment. I Let's talk the numbers first uh, for May. Yeah, so when we look at the May 2024 numbers, um, they were down considerably from April, down 12.7%. Uh, 
uh, month over month. I, I do want to remind us that's still 14% higher than they were a year ago uh, for May. But uh, after what had been a few months of really sideways action in that consumer sentiment index, um, May was certainly a wake-up call of much lower numbers than we had seen for a while. How much, how concerning is that in terms of uh, demand and making sure that supply and demand uh, balance is, is there? So it sure seems like we're seeing more, at least stories out there about how consumers are filling the pinch, uh, higher interest rates, uh, still in uh, high prices. Maybe the inflation has slowed, but still high prices. Uh, we we got more. Uh, I've got a report of more unemployment. I think all those things are real. Perhaps are really starting to weigh. I don't want to. Again, one point is what we have here, uh, but it could be the start of what could be a weaker consumer demand picture as we continue here in 2024. All right. As you look at um, that number specifically, where are you looking um, in the coming mo months in terms of, um, you mentioned unemployment rates, you mentioned interest rates. How much are you watching those for, I guess, back-to-back -back months to kind of see where things are going and and how that kind of shapes shapes us up for the last half of the year? Yeah, so I, I I think as we watch job reports, that's going to give us a good indication of where we're headed for the remainder of 2024. We certainly had less job growth uh, out of that re last report than we would have anticipated pre. Um, we get a, another couple of months of, of that kind of uh, weaker job growth. I think that could very likely lead to lower interest rates. Um, this idea that we're trying to cool uh, the 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 inflation side of this picture might show up if uh, that job growth number stays down for a couple of months. Scott, supply and demand numbers out uh, today, so we're talking on Friday. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what they did for 2024, but interesting as we look ahead, uh, kind of the first glimmer and the first inside look at 2025. So let's start first with, um, I guess, let's start first. Do you want to start with the 2025 projection? No, we can start with 24. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So what are we seeing um, in this month's report? Yes. Yeah, so so I, I think a, a few of the big pieces here, and I'm, I'm going to go to prices on, on, this part of the discussion. So Fed steer prices, USDA lowered their annual average uh, for 2024 by $1.50, 100. Um, 50 cents they took off the barrel and gilt price for 2024, $2.20 off the chicken price for 2024, and, uh, nine cents uh, off the turkey price for 2024. So I, I, I talk about those because I think that's just a little more indication of what their expectation is uh, on the demand side going forward. Uh, if you if you look at the rest of, of the SNU side of the, the, the picture, uh, yeah, they raised beef production about 140 uh, million pounds. They look they lowered chicken production about 300 million pounds. So not not a lot of big change on that front. Uh, but yet prices uh, they have adjusted downward. Uh, the good news is they also adjusted corn price down uh, for the current year by a nickel. Uh, so at least we get some, maybe some more help on the feed price side. Which ultimately works out better or works in favor or is a bright spot on, on the balance sheet uh, looking forward. At least for livestock producers, this is a good, a good sign. We, and we're focusing on livestock today, so we're not necessarily <laughs> focusing on the corn and soybean side of things. All right. As you look ahead and you look at USDA's first uh, estimate for 2025 in terms of livestock numbers, um, I would assume that would indicate maybe there's some room for growth in terms of prices uh, on some of those and, and maybe some potential pressure on a different species. Yeah, for for sure. So if if we if we start on the 
uh, beef side of this equation. And, and I like to start, so 2023 beef production was 27 billion pounds, according to USDA. Um, their first estimate of 2025 beef production is 25.1, sorry, 25.2 billion pounds, uh, al almost a 2 billion pound decline. We don't we don't see that kind of decline very often, and and uh, again, I'm not saying USDA is wrong, but it just tells me how tight beef supplies are going to get. Uh, that's about a two and a half pound decline in per cap consumption uh, over the period. Um, higher imports and lower exports help offset some of the drop in domestic production we see over that period, uh, but. We're going to get tighter. I mean, that, that's the, I think as we all expected, we're going to get tighter in terms of uh, beef supplies. That's probably the, the big one to me that sticks out. Now, USDA is suggesting uh, pork production in 2025 will be up about 330 million pounds relative to their estimate for 2024. Um, I think that's a, a signal of just continued increases in productivity. Um, and when you look at what happens on the price side of the equation, um, $4.50 higher fed, fed steer prices for 2025 is what USDA suggests. Um, they are suggesting what's $2.50 lower barrel and gill prices for 2025. Um, that to me doesn't suggest a lot of uh, black ink. Uh, depending a little bit on where feed costs uh, go as we look ahead. Uh, and I will say on the feed cost side, two two things jump out here. Uh, corn prices that are down 25 cents from the current year and soybean meal prices that are down $50 a ton. Uh, so corn prices would be 5.5% lower uh, and soybean meal prices would be 13% lower uh, than than today's prices. I would have to imagine that obviously this is just a first look across the board, but it should remind producers uh, to think about risk management on on both sides of this the the aisle, right? Both on input and on prices received for for products, uh, knowing that there there's opportunity but to also think about that uncertainty that surrounds demand. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I think framed very well. So demand, particularly for these meat products, there's still uncertainty around that. Demand falls apart. That gives us lower prices. Demand strengthens. Well, we could, we could still see higher prices. Now, on the feed cost side of this equation, USDA's got a 181 corn yield in for this fall. Um, if weather turns dry in in July um, and they reduce that, it doesn't take much of a, a yield reduction to start to talk about higher fee costs. So deciding when you want to lock in some of those input uh, prices and output prices could really be important. This volatility uh, likely hangs with us as we go through here 2024. Scott, that'll do it for us today. Great to see you as always. Likewise, Megan. As you look ahead to next week, retail prices, what are you looking for? I think I think this is a good indication of uh, whether we're get, seeing any weakness at the retail side. Um, the, I think this could kind of help us yet again talk about the demand side of the picture and where we see things uh, as, as we get further here into 2024. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next Friday. Sounds good, Megan. So have our weekly livestock market update delivered to your email box every Saturday morning. Go to brownfieldagnews.com. You can also submit questions and comments there. And for market updates twice daily, make sure to check out John Perkins Market Minute. Have a great weekend. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield. Mm -hmm.